Hi, uh, welcome to this panel, which is part of the Living Nature program um, that's being run by British, the British Library and Flourishing Diversity. Uh, my name is Phoebe Tickell and I'm hosting this panel with our wonderful guests. I'm very excited to move on to introduce them all in a second. Um, I'm a scientist and a deep ecologist who works with imagination and new ways of thinking inspired by biology to connect people to nature and a long time perspective. Uh, in a second, we're going to hear from our speakers one by one to speak on the topic of this panel, Living Nature. And then just to let you know about the agenda, we'll have roughly a 45 minute open discussion between all of our speakers. Um, and then I'll make sure we have 10 minutes for audience questions, which I'll be fielding in the background so you can um, contribute your questions and we'll, we'll be fielding those. And we plan to finish actually 15 minutes later than originally planned. So we were planning on finishing at 5.30, um, but we'll, we'll go on until 5.45 and, and wrap up then. So Living Nature. Living Nature is a new hybrid program exploring the future of human relationships with nature through the lens of art, science and indigenous wisdom. And on this panel, we've got people with backgrounds and experience working across those different areas. Now, survival on this planet depends on embedding truly sustainable ways in our culture, but also our economy, our institutions, practices, and also our imaginations. We need to truly appreciate that we're embedded within a larger whole, within nature and a complex entangled web of interdependence. As elder and deep ecologist Joanna Macy says, every mythical story, spiritual tradition, or religion has a tale of mistaken identity and that's truly what's happened to us in, in Western societies here, here on earth, as we've forgotten, not just that we're embedded in nature, but that actually we are nature. Collective flourishing requires new kinds of leadership and an inclusion of voices and beings not currently at the table. We need to rethink how we make decisions, who takes part in them, who is represented and listened to, and incorporate the voices of many stakeholders who are not currently at the table, for example, indigenous peoples from across the planet who are responsible for protecting 80% of the planet's biodiversity and who stewarded living ancient culture of how to live harmoniously with nature and realize at the core that we're interconnected and interrelated to all living beings. If we truly embed nature into our systems, what could that look like? What kind of thinking do we have to do away with, let go of? What do we need to let die? What are the emerging buds of a new such system where we can see examples of this embeddedness of nature coming into being? We will be diving into questions around bringing nature's intelligence into the core of our systems and society and exploring what positive human nature relationships could look like at a global scale. So without further ado, I'm going to open our panel, which is called Living Nature. Uh, and I'm, here, I'm joined here today by Helena Gualinga, an indigenous environmental and human rights activist from the Quichua Sarayaku community in Pastaza, Ecuador. Alex Antonelli, professor of biodiversity and director of science at the Royal Botanical Gardens in Kew. Ruben Fayoka Brooks, chair and founder of the British Ecological Society's READ Network, which stands for the Racial and Ethnic Equality and Diversity Network, who is also a master's graduate of zoology. Swetha Stotra Bashyam, Global South, South Focal Point of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network uh, and wildlife biologist with a master's degree in wildlife biology and conservation. And last but not least, Marcus Coates, a contemporary artist and ornithologist, which I had to look up and that means study of birds. So welcome to all our panelists. It's great to have you here and we've got a really diverse mix of yeah, experiences and, and viewpoints. I'm gonna dive straight in. What, we, what I'd love to open with is to hear from each of you on what it means to transition to systems that embed nature. So you've got roughly three to five minutes to just speak um, and, and potentially weaving in your work and experience and view on this question. So the question is, from your point of view and the work that you do, what are you doing to catalyze this shift to nature being at the core of everything we do? And what do you see as being most important? And I'd like to start with Ruben. Ruben, over to you. Hi, thank you, Phoebe. Well, um, I've had some thought about this question and I think how I'm in or integrating or almost replicating nature is by 
um, more the diversity element of nature, the biodiverse element of nature that is um, almost innate within nature in terms of trying to find avenues or varying different avenues to um, accomplish or fix a certain solution or task. And um, how I've emulated that is by trying al almost to replicate that within the environmental and ecological sciences. And uh, at the moment, it's one of the um, least diverse um, sectors um, or job sectors. It's only what 3% of environmental professionals actually identify as um, minorities. So I think based on that and just my own experiences, just like being at university, I wanted to tackle that and almost increase the diversity element um, within those sectors. So it's almost how I'm almost embedding nature into what I'm doing is almost replicating it in a way, if that makes any sense. And that's kind of led me to, um, well, came up with the idea of setting up this a network to help marginalized groups within these indie sectors and to basically essentially create an academic hub of support um, which as a byproduct will serve as a form of representation and to inspire you know both old and young people like to continue within the sector and um, to actually consider the sector or mm -hmm. ecology as a, a viable career path going forward and um, yeah so I, I, that's what I think that's if that fits, if, it, if that <laughs> answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, we'll have a chance to dive in a bit more um, to, yeah, to hear more about your work in that area. So thanks, thanks for that. Um, I will call upon Swetha. Would you like to yeah, tell us a little bit about the work that you do and what you're seeing is most important in terms of this shift to putting nature at the center of everything we do? And don't forget to unmute. <laughs> Thanks, Vivi. Uh, so I would like to first start off by us acknowledging where we are and wh where is here right now. Uh, we are all living in a very complex, interconnected world. And this world is currently facing cascading crises. Now, uh, to understand where how, we also need to understand how we got here. And the fact that these crises, let it be the climate crisis or the biodiversity crisis, did not just start with the Industrial Revolution. It started with the ideology of unlimited production, growth, and consumption. It started with the ideologies of patriarchy, of colonialism, of racism. It also started with the ideologies of uh, uh, white supremacy, of sexism. And we need to understand this context as we go into understanding where we need to go and where we need to head. Now, this is the current uh, values and principles that are a part of our society today. And it is also a part of the broken system that we are living in. Now, if we need to build out of the system, basically uproot it and destroy the system, we need to first think about what, uh, how do we need to create something called transformative change, which as uh, IBES, which is the intergovernmental science policy, uh, science policy platform for biodiversity and ecosystem services has explained a fundamental change in values, behaviors, priorities, and actions that we have in, uh, in our society today to realign it so that we can live in harmony with nature. But such a fundamental change in our entire system of governance and economic models is not going to be easy and it's not going to happen overnight. And we need to acknowledge that it's also not going to happen just by pushing for political change, as we've already seen from the Paris Agreement. What we do see as future generations now, that is that this change really needs to start in culture. It needs to begin from a cultural change. Now, creating such a cultural change is what Gibbon has been, uh, the Global Youth Biodiversity Network has been trying to do over several years now. We want to create a culture where we can create a culture of inclusion, a, a culture where we're gonna create a systematic, uh, a systematic place where we can have empathy, care, and honesty in the world. Now, creating this culture is also to create a sense of belonging, a sense of belonging and sense of feeling like you're a part of nature. And that is really important because our generation now is realizing more and more that uh, having uh, a sense of belonging does not come from materialistic gain. Having more and more is not uh, better. Better is actually being better. Now, uh, we are actually using uh, learning from this, uh, from our previous uh, generations, that we need to start redefining ourselves, redefining our future and our pathways that are creating our future. Now, for us, the way we are seeing uh, a way forward 
is actually by looking at indigenous people and local communities, because uh, by learning from their wisdom and their understanding of the world, uh, with, with the intergenerational learning that they have had with field observations and science that they have uh, inculcated and gained over thousands of years. It is them that we need to look towards to actually understand how do we create these kind of systems which embed nature at the core. Now, uh, along with that, we also realize as, we, uh, as uh, young, young people that education can play a very critical role in creating such a transformative change. To create transformative change, we need to transform our education system. To, realign, uh, to help us realign these values, priorities, and actions so that we can actually move towards creating generations that can actually live in harmony with nature. Thank you. What a fantastic opening, Swetha. Thank you for that tour de force. Well, yeah, I've got many things I'd like to pick up on what you've just said. Um, and But for now, I'll pass on to Alex from RBGQ. Thank you. Um, very good thoughts already expressed. Um, I, I like to think of these in three words. And my first word is going to be knowledge. We know now that two in five plant species face extinction. And this is a very simple number. It's very easy to remember. But that's actually the outcome of um, a huge amount of work by hundreds of scientists around the world, including my colleagues at the Robert and Gardens team. And uh, we have about one million species now facing extinction over the next decades. So we know that we are in the middle of uh, a mass extinction of species, um, the, the worst one in human history. You have to go back 66 million years to find something similar, which killed the dinosaurs. But at the same time, we've never had as much knowledge um, about species, which species are in danger and what they need. And of course, besides all the scientific knowledge, as both Swetha and Ruben have highlighted now, there's a huge amount of traditional and indigenous knowledge um, from indigenous communities. So, um, Things like this, um, I have, I'm Brazilian, um, I grew up in Brazil and I have some relatives in the indigenous communities and we have lots of those things at home. And it's so rich, the diversity of which species are used for which purposes and combining that knowledge because some of the species here that they use are really sustainable. You can um, use them and, and really they're going to regenerate and others perhaps are becoming more uh, in danger. So combining the scientific knowledge about which of those species can be used and the traditional knowledge about how to use them is really the way uh, moving forward. And my second word is feelings, because um, we know that the level of challenge we're facing today with both the climate and the biodiversity crisis are absolutely huge. And um, as Sven also mentioned, tackling them will really require a, a huge amount of commitment from all levels. And I think we can only do that if you're really caring about it. It's not enough with facts. It's not enough with information. Um, and I think the only reason we are solving the COVID crisis now is because we actually care. You know, we want to go and see our families, see our friends, we want to travel. So we really care. We have a personal connection to the problem and we need to create that um, around the climate and environmental crisis facing today. And I think that art and culture are really critical to achieve and to increase that, that commitment from people. And my, my third and last word is change. Uh, and uh, I think we have all realized that we cannot keep doing business as usual. We must change nearly everything we do. So it's all, all levels, everything that we do, we consume um, all our patterns and our leaders at COP26, the climate conference in Glasgow starting uh, in a few days, uh, COP15, the, the, the biodiversity meeting in May in China next year. So at all levels of society, we need to change. And I think that with knowledge, the first word, with feelings, the second word, putting them together, I, I am very confident we actually can achieve change and for the better. I'll stop there. Thank you, Alex. Helena, I'll pass to you next. Uh, thank you. Um, so I come from an indigenous community and I come from an indigenous community that has been since I can remember been protecting our territories and, um, and very successfully done so. Uh, we're the first indigenous community in Ecuador and in South America to uh, win a lawsuit against Ecuadorian state or any state for the matter um, in, in South America over our territorial rights um, in, in an international court. Um, so, so it really comes down to um, how, how are we able to do that as a community, as a community out in the Amazon um, with 
1,200 uh, people in the community. Uh, no, no access to Wi-Fi, no access to any type of, you know, new technologies back then. Um, and, and it really came down to, you know, unity. It came down to us having a very, very strong identity and of us having a very strong sense of, of um, feeling everything that was around us. Um, so ever, ever since we were children, we are taught that the forest is living, which is, you know, this panel's name is, is living nature. So um, the, the vision that we have in my community is actually called the living forest. And in the living forest, we do not only see that, um, you know, the trees are living and et cetera. We also see mountains, the rivers, the waterfalls, you know. Um, and, and by living, it's not just a scientifically like um, definition of, of something being alive. It's something that has a spirit as something that has its own being. Um, so we, in 2018, created this proposal to, uh, to the Ecuadorian government um, as uh, rights, of, rights of nature is already recognized in the constitution. Um, we had another proposal to um, create living forest areas where the state would no longer have access to whether it would be um, resources above uh, ground or underground um, to make sure that the rights of nature and the rights of the living forest are respected as much as uh, human rights are respected, for example. So the living forest would be um, a being with rights as human have rights. And in that way, we can legally um, protect territories and we can legally protect um, uh, uh, these, these ecosystems and, and beings that, that, that uh, are, in, are in these um, spaces. Um, but to achieve that, there is definitely a, a need for a, a mind shift. Um, we need to see this from another perspective. Um, I think right now we are used to not only exploiting nature, but exploiting people. And that is where our entire societies are based on wherever we go. There is this pattern of exploitation. Um, doesn't matter the country, doesn't matter really the culture. Um, that is what, what we are used to. Um, and and how we in, in my community and in a lot of indigenous communities have been able to combat that is exactly with having this, this very strong sense of identity um, and, and very strong relationship to where we come from and to, my, to our home. Um, and a lot of time there's a lot of criticism against indigenous people mostly within our own countries when people say, oh, but um, indigenous people are, you know, living off the land or, um, uh, you know, there are some parts of, of the indigenous population that contributes to extractivism. Um, and then we have to think about, okay, what is actually causing this? It's the, 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 a constantly in invasion of, of, of our territories and um, the industry forcing itself into our, our, our territories, into our culture, um, and, and the constant uh, feeling of that you have to keep up with the modern world to make sure that you uh, can thrive, which cause extreme, a, a huge amount of harm to our communities. We see, um, you know, uh, because our identities are lost and because uh, this feeling of, of belonging are lost, we lose our languages, we lose our knowledge. And with that, with that losing our knowledge and our languages, we also lose um, the, the sense of taking care of earth and taking care of the living forest. Um, so it's really, really important to make sure that indigenous communities can keep doing the work and that we can keep, you know, um, the, the, our, our culture that is exactly what it, you know uh, protecting nature is about you know that is embedded in our culture and not just in our culture but in, in the way that we live in the way that we interact not just with nature but with people too um, so there needs to be we need to find this uh, balance and we need to find this 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 way of of, of approaching 
um, indigenous communities without creating that harm. So it goes on to, to us hurting ourselves um, because we can see like a lot of examples how respecting nature and living and being part of nature can be extremely successful. And we can see how it can go really wrong and how um, that is, you know, in, in the end uh, contributing to these huge crises that we have in the world that are gonna be um, discussed at, at COP in Glasgow. Um, and, and these are really, really, you know, big things that we're up against. Um, and I think indigenous knowledge and indigenous, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, knowledge should be in, in the center of, of, of the discussion. Thank you so much for that provocation. We're gonna pass finally to Marcus. Marcus, over to you. Thank you, yeah, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, it's always nice as an artist to show you pictures, but unfortunately I can't do that. So you'll, you'll start with my face and my explanations. So I just wanted to address uh, some of these questions with three recent works really, and um, let those speak for themselves in a way. Um, I think primarily, um, well, I should say I've been an artist for uh, since about 1990. And I've always addressed this idea of otherness in nature, this idea of um, how we build relationships to other species and how culture is, or my culture is so inadequate in that sense. Um, and how, how important it is that these, these relationships are meaningful and useful to us um, and not exploitative. Um, I think the main focus of my work looks at the idea that our primary relationship with nature exists in our subjective worlds. Not many of us have much proximity to nature, to, to other species, to, a little bit to plants, but mainly it really exists in, in our imagination, I feel, and, and developing ways that culture can support that um, to enrich the narratives, the myths, the beliefs, and, and those relationships is very important. Um, so uh, the first project I briefly want to speak about is called Ask the Wild. Um, and this is a, a project I do with a, another artist called Fiona McDonald. It's a collaboration. And we basically ask the public to come to these events we run and they come and they ask questions of a panel. We, we form a panel. Um, and the panel um, basically are natural history experts and scientists. And so the first one we did was called Ask the Woodland. So there were botanists, um, and um, experts in fungi, um, all sorts of experts who, who are interested in, in woodlands. And the, the public come, and they don't ask questions about woodlands, they ask questions about their lives. So their questions are personal, they're social, they're political, um, they're about Brexit, they're about um, um, all sorts of sexual problems, anything, anything that they, they, they need answers for. And the panel just answer those in terms of their knowledge of the woodland. And so we're really looking for what we can learn from nature, what, how we can imbue this scientific knowledge and cultural knowledge of, of, of woodlands um, into our everyday lives and make it um, uh, functioning and useful for us. And so far we've done events called uh, Ask the Sea, where we had um, marine experts ask the ash, just about that one tree, ask the apes, and we had primatologists asking questions answering questions, ask the birds, and just about to do ask the ants. So it's, um, yeah, it's a kind of making that, that scientific um, knowledge um, a, pra a, a pragmatic tool for people really beyond its, its own discipline. Um, another project I'd like to just mention is, um, it's, a, it's called Nature Calendar really. And this is about bringing the idea of um, uh, events in nature into our everyday lives. So I've developed with scientists um, nature calendars that are specific to places around the world. And these, um, basically every day, there's an event in nature that happens in that area. So, um, so on the 12th of December in nor Northern Europe, salmon are trying to ascend up the rivers from the sea to spawn upstream. This is one of the events. Um, and these nature calendars are disseminated to the public in different forms. I do print versions of them that I, I, I give to classrooms at school. So before every, every day at school, the teacher reads out one of these messages. What's happening in nature today? 
and it becomes a, a discussion point to start the day before any learning happens. Um, in Utrecht, in the Netherlands, uh, there's a, a huge LED sign that, that I put up. Um, and I was commissioned to do this. Um, and each day that LED sign says um, an event that's happening in nature in, in, in Northern Europe. So people in their ritualistic way, their habitual way, are going to the station, getting the train, but also being informed, their imagination is being imbued with things that are happening that they, they, will, they will never encounter. So these things that happen in nature live in their imagination in that way. And I'm trying to sort of <clears throat> create that fusion where, where practically it's very hard to do that. Um, and also bring that into education as well. And the last pro project I'd just like to mention very quickly is called, um, I did quite recently on an island in Canada, in, in Newfoundland, the island of Fogo. And this was a place where um, the great orc, an amazing bird, which was once quite, well, very numerous around that, that island and the world, Northern hemisphere, was killed in vast numbers for its meat and feathers. And by 1844, it was extinct worldwide. So I really wanted the Canadian government to apologize for this extinction um, and make that um, a, a, a political statement about that and, and um, make that actually happen. And also create some kind of, um, so it wasn't tokenistic, there were some um, influences and um, uh, possibilities that came from that apology. Um, so I formed this committee which is an apology committee of local people on the island and some conservation experts. And we drafted up an apology for the Canadian government. And um, I took that to the mayor of, of, of the island and he signed that as a statement. And he read it out in public through a loudspeaker to the islands where the, the great orcs used to live. And this was sort of um, witnessed by the public. And that apology has now become a something that I use and I've built on in terms of creating um, public public um, recitals of apologies to to um, all the species that have become extinct, but all the future species that are threatened and in a wider sense um, against um, exploitation, extractivism and settler colonialism. So, um, yeah, that, that apology has become quite a, um, a, a potent form now. Okay, that's me. Thank you, Marcus. And um, maybe we can have somebody put your website in the chat so that people can take a look at um, the images of your artworks as well, because I'm sure, yeah, sometimes images speak even louder than words, but fascinating to hear about your projects, kind of get bringing hearts and minds together of people to, yeah, to engage and care about the planet. Um, great, so for, ne for next we have around 30 minutes, I think, for an open discussion. And what I'd like to do is to bring a mix of questions that are kind of aimed at um, a single one of you and then open for a bit more of a discussion. Um, to start with, I wanted to ask uh, Helena, just following up on some of what you said and um, having read a little bit about your work and your journey growing up between Finland and Ecuador, um, there was a quote uh, that you said, which was, that in, in your opinion, the world can learn from indigenous people's respect for the environment and how they risk their lives to protect it and apply this to the global fight against climate change. And you also just mentioned that you really believe that indigenous knowledge should be at the center of the discussions in COP. And I was just curious to start by asking you about um, how, what have you found challenging in, in your work in actually bringing indigenous knowledge and wisdom to the center of such discussions or bringing that knowledge and worldview into places where, um, yeah, it's, it's completely new to people. And how do, you, how do you do that? What's that like? Um, I think the biggest challenge is that people are not prepared for it. Uh, for a lot of people, it feels like nonsense because um, in the West, we are used to talking about numbers statistics um and that's as far as like people can imagine other realities um so the 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 one of the biggest challenges i've met is you know how close-minded people actually are people that you expect to be visionaries you know um and and i feel like that is it's it's really sad to see that type of um disconnection 
Uh, and I think that's the one of the main issues too, what has led to this, because there is no understanding um, further than the statistics, the numbers, you know, and that it, it may reflect one part of the reality, but is not the bigger, like you cannot see the bigger picture with that. Um, and I think that is also what, like one of the main issues at COP uh, and has been for, for many, many years, um, that a lot of it is, is you know, numbers and not seeing the reality and the real impact. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. I really resonate with that. And it's part of the reason I left um, my academic job in uh, biology and science and now work a lot more with imagination and art. Um, and that kind of weaves into what you were talking about, Alex, and when you spoke about knowledge and feeling and change, I was thinking head, heart and hands. And as you're working at um, the Botanical Gardens in Kew, I guess you've got quite an interesting insight into the ways that you can create immersive experiences or work with culture to communicate um, numbers and science, but in ways that actually engage the heart as well. And so I was just curious if you wanted to say a bit about that and um, yeah, just maybe the, the tensions that you find between those different ways of knowing and methods of communicating. Thank you. I think that's a really important topic. And, you know, I'm a scientist, so I feel guilty about coming up with too many statistics and too many numbers, but not really speaking to what people really care about. Um, and I agree with you that I think that there's a big challenge in terms of communication, in terms of reaching out to drive those changes. So at Q, we have um, a large number of visitors. Maybe I shouldn't say but two, yeah, two, two million um, com people coming to us. It's, it's a large number. And we are trying to uh, make them get an experience, get a feeling for what they see. But at the same time, we feel that we are not um, only a visitor attraction. We, we feel that if people leave the garden without knowing, without a new knowledge, without understanding a bit more than they did before they arrived, we failed. So if it's just about coming to a nice garden and having a you know an ice cream or uh, a nice moment with their family, it, that's absolutely fine. But we want them to understand and, and, to, and to connect. And that's what we're working a lot with our visitor experience in terms of signage, in terms of um, uh, talks, many activities to, to our visitors to connect to uh, the reality that's happening out there. And I think this, this connection is really the, the most important uh, aspect, why we haven't really succeeded in the past with a lot of the plans uh, from the previous COPs, for instance. Um, I think what Helena said in terms of uh, this disconnect is really critical when it comes, for instance, to the pledges made by uh, policymakers now, you know, our leaders at COP, that they're going to plant billions and billions of trees all over the place, and they have no understanding whatsoever about which trees they're talking about, how this is actually going to be, you know, experienced by the local people. There's no communication with the stakeholders, with the local people, communities living there. And at the same time as you're know, cutting down the forest in Ecuador, in, in my home country, Brazil. So I think there's a disconnect between reality and the people making the decisions, which will have this long knock-on effect uh, all the way to the ground. And we need to break that disconnect and really connect uh, them again. And I think that, you know, indigenous communities and um, traditional knowledge is absolutely critical here because we can learn so much from that. Mm. Yeah, it can really feel like it's such an uphill battle when you think about, um, you know, even our children growing up in the West, eating food from plastic wrapping. And so, you know, there's this total disconnect of, of really knowing and connecting with the source of things, with, with the fact that we eat living things, that we, you know, we're, we're intimately interconnected with with the living world but it's such a disconnection and we've created this kind of cage of man-made um yeah like a man-made maze and so I, th I really feel like that's a theme between a lot of the work that you're doing here is using art using culture using imagination and and yeah and also bringing indigenous knowledge and wisdom and and I feel like it, we're so lucky that there are still living cultures that that put nature at the at the heart of all things and and it's yeah it's just very important that we create ways to listen and also learn um Swetha, i think you spoke about the the necessary role of education and i just wanted to pick pick up on that that you know when you're talking about um education being 
super important um, to you, were you meaning about educating children or also adults and have you worked in that area? Do you have anything you'd like to expand on that? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, so for us, education kind of uh, came into being as a core topic that we are pushing for at the policy level, but also at all levels, wherever we are, uh, are wherever we as young people have a sphere of influence, we are trying to bring it in there. And this came up as a core topic, largely from talking to more and more young people and finding out what actually made them change or made them re uh, understand that, you know, this is so important and the, 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 the fight we are fighting right now is so important. And most of the time, everybody has told us that it was this one lecture, one person, one individual, one conversation that made them uh, made them have this realization. And that was the same for me as well. So we actually realized that education has such an immense role to play, but is so uh, underplayed in our policy context in several places that we are really downplaying the, the amount of power that education has on our community and shaping our generations to come. So what we are doing uh, in the Global Youth Biodiversity Network is actually working with young people from across the globe to actually create a, a transformative education task force and actually ask them and work with them to understand how would we want to transform the education system? What, what does it mean to transform it? And some of the things that young people have told us is that we need to have an education system that talks about uh, you know, sustainability, biodiversity, and justice. They, they, we want to have an education system that is uh, that needs to penetrate all kind of curricula and at all levels. It's not just for the young. It's not just for the old. It's for everybody. And we need to find ways of in, incorporating it in both the formal education curricula, but also informal and non-formal education sectors. And the kind of things that young people are realizing that we need to have in our education is this kind of interdisciplinary learning. Uh, it's a learning that we gain from the experiences of people from uh, different worldviews, like Helena was mentioning. So having a space where we can actually learn from different people, from different languages, different cultures, and also from different generations is kind of critical to be able to create a, 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 a way forward of understanding how we can start reinculcating this kind of a sense of belonging that you can get with nature. And uh, Helena is completely right. When she was talking, I was, I was actually thinking about this, that in the global north, it is very true that you have this data driven thing. But in the south, it's very different. I, I remember um, like while I was a, a child and how, how my grandmother used to tell me stories about our mythology and also it was so connected to nature. And then I kind of unlearned that while I became a, a my life biologist and then went into data and stats. But now I'm starting to kind of uh, uh, relearn some of these things that were taught to me as a child and realizing that these connections exist for several people in the global South. And we need to uh, give space to inculcate these connections and not ridicule them and say they are just a part of our, you know, our stories and then leave them there and then just focus on data. And I think that's a part of what transformative education starts, should bring in that openness to understanding that we need to uh, kind of learn from all these worldviews. So yeah, so I think this is kind of where we are looking at it and where we are trying to bring it in to the, into the political system, but also through our work and our workshops and all the work that we are doing across uh, the globe right now. Thank you, so that feels, feels like there's quite a few scientists in the room and biologists who have been on this journey themselves. And it's interesting because as a, uh, a young budding um, biologist, I went into biology too out of a love for nature and for the planet. And it was it was closer to a spiritual relationship to, to science than it was to, you know, a kind of wanting to learn lots of data and facts. And I had the same experience at, at university of finding, um, you know, taking ecology modules and actually finding that it largely consisted of learning the names of many, many species, cutting things up like you know the whole thing the whole point of ecology was to is to learn about life and the large the main practice is to take uh, creatures into the lab and kill them and dissect them so it, it's yeah it does start to feel like we've really gone off uh, track in in our relationship to the natural world and how we learn about it and actually what for like what what is the role of science really um if, if not to help us learn how to be in better relationship to the world and, and discover um, about the wonder of the, the cosmos. Um, 
yeah and, and so Marcus your your work clearly bridges science and art and and you're clearly quite deep in thinking about ways to harness the public imagination and come up with new ways to communicate um you know these facts like there are this many species dying or as uh, uh, Alex was saying you know two and five plant species I think are at risk of extinction like these are facts these are things we know these are things that are true and yet when I hear those things they don't actually reach my heart and so what is the role of art in playing a role in, in helping scientists who are doing that work to come up to find you know come up with the research and um, provide the facts and the evidence for the changes that need to happen um, but but without actually bringing that alive in an experience and in in a in a feeling um, it, it won't go as far so yeah I'd love to hear about what you think on that yeah well uh, I think artists work in many different ways some some people um just want to interpret um data and, and make it make it um, um accessible and interesting in a visual way and you know i think that's there's something to be said for that um i mean for me personally i'm, I'm really in, interested in how you take a statistic like that and you look at the the sentiment and the psychology behind what well, well that creates the emotions behind that and how you start to embed that into, um, in, in, you sort of um, reinculcate that, as someone used that word, into a, a, a pra in a pragmatic way into our lives. So it just doesn't just exist as an emotion in an isolated way. It's actually informing other actions. It's informing decision making. It's informing in, on a political um, on a level, and that's that seems to me to be the the, the massive challenge. It's how do we take these things that are um, desperately rational, really, these statistics, this, this, this scientific, scientific information, these truths, how do we take these and um, um, bring them into an embodied experience, uh, into the imagination, into a, a physicality, into an ex experiential realm, which is another form and an equally valid form of knowing. And anyone from any indigenous society knows this. This is this is this is how the world. Um, this is how the, the the imaginative world and the consensus reality. There's a fluidity between those. And in my Western culture, this there's been a mind wipe. This this doesn't exist. They're they're two separate entities, and one is just not validated in, in those terms. And you have to have. I feel as an artist, you have to have this embodied experiential knowledge and this scientific knowledge. And there's plenty more other types of knowledge too. And they all have to be in the same melting point and they all have to be given significance. And unless you do that, it's impossible to, to create relationships and valuable relationships to, to, to ecology in the wider world. Beautiful. Does anybody have anything to jump in on that um, before I come to Ruben? Yeah, no, I was... Um... I think touching on Helena's point in terms of lived, lived experience and the importance of including that in terms of understanding um, the processes behind science or of science, or just in general. I think um, it remains quite dear to me because at the moment I'm in actually psychological research and lived experience is by definition integral um, part of designing a research study because said research study is often associated with human participants and i think in ecology and environmental sciences because as humans there's that anthropocentric kind of mindset that humans are almost disconnected from the environment and ecology there isn't, isn't really a need to include them in the design and understanding of said research project because it isn't really about them but it is about them so based on, and I think that's kind of what's contributed to almost this um, incessant need of processing or understanding the data behind these environmental systems and et cetera. But I think that it almost needs to, well, ecology and environmental sciences almost need to learn from what's happening, well, mental health science and the psychological science and that actually including individuals um, that might not necessarily be academics or have a, a fundamental understanding behind um, the processes of that research, but um, are embedded or maybe indirectly affected by said research. And that actually helps all, almost 
helps you one um, look at the secondary effects or the uh, byproducts of what you may be looking at and almost sometimes even help um, actually you catch things that you may have missed in terms of you um, developing hypothesis or or uh, looking at certain results for instance um, so yeah I thought that was interesting in that and even if you included some form of lived experience in developing research in the, at that well after research has been produced actively seeing an individual that has um, directly affected said research or has been affected by that research it could maybe change the perception of um, uh, uh, ecology and and our interpretation of what the environment is just and nature just generally um, because I feel like that disconnect as I think um, Alexandra had mentioned um, is causing a lot of problems and has kind of led to a, a situation which we are in now and uh, may help in the forms of transparency going forward and you know this uh, com common uh, anti or anti-science or anti-intellectualism that's kind of kind of spreading throughout the West um, and it may or help, help combat that because for instance in psychological research that has in a sense uh, lifted some form of taboo um, associated with the research um, if for instance a participant knows what that research is about they're more likely to participate in right or if it's broken down into you know easily digestible information packets that they, they can actually fully understand what's going on and if that approach was actually done in you know in in ecology environmental sciences maybe leaders would actually see how much more of an importance or have a better understanding of what what's actually going on the process processes of what's going on and how it might directly affect themselves um but yeah thank you Ruben. has anybody got anything else to add to that we move on alex go ahead um can, can i just really um thank both Ruben and um and helena for raising this thing about um you know the anthropocentric view and uh, you know the, the rights of nature i think that's really a huge step forward um and it's a, a, it's somewhere it's something that people are really miles away uh, most of our leaders so i think um you know acknowledging the intrinsic value of nature of for existing um and not having that view that you know those species up there they're just slaves to humankind they're just there for us and you know unless we have something to gain from them and, and in benefits and in medicines, there's no value in conserving them. I still see that a lot, um, not least among scientists. And, you know, um, I think there's too much of this utilitarian view and we, we're not getting anywhere with that. So I'm really um, impressed by the way that Ecuador has done it and, and uh, New Zealand, Bhutan, several countries in the US. So more and more people are acknowledging the rights of nature. In the constitution and of course what happens when you break when you infringe on those rights and i think that's where the concept of ecocide you know a massive destruction of an environment uh, which cannot be allowed and you know I'm, I'm really seeing that in my home country brazil now i think with the amazon and i think we're seeing that a bit everywhere now so i think there's a there's a re there's a question around how do we take those feelings and those understandings to to the legal enforcement um of nature's rights. And I'm really keen to see that develop um, in the future. Mm. I think it's really interesting that the rights of nature have uh, come up because they, it does feel like um, such, a, such a kind of cutting edge in terms of policy of reflecting our sentiments, our lived experience of being one with nature. I still sometimes worry that um, even by talking about nature as if it's something that is separate, to us, it, it kind of reinforces this loop of, of separation as if nature is out there and we are human beings and we need to protect nature as if it's something separate. Um, Helen, I, I guess there are probably quite a few areas where there's this, where it's kind of embedded in, in the Western culture in terms of like separation and subtle ways that perhaps like we don't even notice that this separation is created and enforced by language or rituals or um, yeah, many, many different things. I'm just curious whether um, 
yeah, how, how you've shared some of the indigenous knowledge and indi indigenous practices and wisdom um, with people from, from different cultures and whether there's any, um, anywhere that you see a particular challenge or struggle to shift, I think you spoke about the mind shifts, like where are the kind of sticky points, the places that it's really difficult to shift um, people's minds and views and perceptions? Um, I think the people that are like hardest to, to change, I guess, or to talk about these things are the people that I've never heard or never experienced anything like that. Um, you know, a lot of people like go, for example, like hiking of like once a year, twice a year, maybe. And that's like this like highlight of the year. And that's like something out of the ordinary that they're doing because um, they're very used to living in the in these like bubbles and cities and, and you know very disconnected well where I come from like that is something that we do every day because we gotta walk to my grandmother like I, got, I gotta take a canoe there or I gotta walk for you know through the rainforest to get there um, and and just like you know um, for example like in my community we 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 drink this certain tea every morning uh, wake up very early before sun rises at five four three depends on which household it is um, and and this outside my community can many times be called like a like a ceremony but that is you know something that we consider part of our lifestyle it's it's, you know sitting down and drinking some tea and it is a very important like uh it, it is a very important um uh you know moment of of the day um but it's not something out of the ordinary that is a part of like the way we live um so explaining this to people can be really hard and explaining okay like there are beings in the mountains and they're like oh but can you see them or like, what is it? You need to have it explained to you. Um, and it's really hard for, for people to, to think outside of that. And, and I think also when it comes to nature, people don't understand what rights of nature mean. I've met a lot of people that are like, you know, I understand that it's important to protect, protect nature, but what is rights of nature gonna do? Cause we still have, we have environmental laws. I think what is important about rights of nature is understanding that there is you know as to human beings you, there is there can be conflicts there can be you know you don't necessarily have to agree with every single person you meet but there is a limit that you cannot cross when it comes to human rights there is a, 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 a there is a line where there is a violation of rights other than just not agreeing on a certain thing or you know having whatever conflict um and it it's the same thing with 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 nature there you know for humans to stay alive to 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 eat to drink water we need to take from nature but at, at, uh, as the same way with human there is a limit where there is a violation of rights you know and that needs to be very very clear this is a line we cannot cross because this um, will uh, bring immense, you know, destruction to nature, to ecosystems, uh, water, like, you know, if it, it, it must be for like this planet to survive, it must be a violation of rights. And it should be in every single country in the constitution. Um, if there is an oil spill, if there is pollution uh, in water, you know, this, that should be illegal, that should be a violation, it should not be accepted legally, nor should it be accepted by our societies, because, you know, it, for example, in my country, like, if there is an oil spill, you won't read about it in the newspapers. Um, it's, it's, it's so common that people, it's, there is, like, people don't even talk about it, like, the politicians don't even bring it up, there's, no coverage because it's so accepted by the non-indigenous society that there are oil spills, that there are um, like violations to nature happening. Um, so I think that is really, really important to make sure that, okay, th that the legal tool that Ecuador, for example, has and other, uh, other countries are implementing actually work and that they are implemented in the judicial system, which they're really not right now. And we really need to work for that. Um, and, and, and how we can make that, uh, you know, legal tool work is by 
you know, having this mind shift of, okay, this is, you know, this is a violation. We cannot cross this. This is something that should never be accepted. Um, so I, I think that, that saying it in those words, people have a, 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 a understand it a little better. Cause that, then I'm speaking their language of how like the system works and how like uh, the ju judicial system works and then they can kind of understand it. Um, so I, I, every time I need to explain something like this, I really need to not speak their language and okay, speak English for example, but speak with the words and with their reality. So I need to base every conversation on what I know their reality is like. Thank you. That's, uh, yeah, super interesting that you can find ways to interface with the different groups and, yeah, different kind of people who, co who come from very different worlds, maybe different tools and different ways of expressing um, what is at the core is, is clearly really valuable. And, uh, last of all, I, I really wanted to make time, uh, Ruben, to just uh, spend a bit of time finding a bit out about your journey from being a zoologist to going into uh, psychology research because it also feels like a very interesting shift given that we're talking here about valuing nature and about science and knowledge but then also about feeling and and yeah the actually the ways that we perceive and think and and those kinds of things so I'm just curious about your yeah that that journey um, and I'm also curious about your work in increasing diversity within zoologists and ecologists. And um, yeah, could, that, that's also gonna play a key role that if all ecologists and zoologists and scientists look the same, act the same, speak the same, then that's also gonna affect the power and the strength of the message of, of zoologists to the world. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to open to hearing yeah, about um... So uh, my route from zoology um, into psychology, re psychological research was uh, something of an unexpected turn. Um, it has its basis of um, that it was planned in some formal way. I think in university, I think I was a bit similar to you, Phoebe. I think I went in guns blazing, you know, animal behaviour, safe to animals, conservationists. I think as um, the years went by, especially my undergraduate degree, I realized that that was almost, I didn't think that was a, the right approach to fixing things. In my head, I thought the approach was the right approach is by going from the top down, um, looking at policymakers, going to leadership and actually trying to change things from that, from there. And then hopefully, because it's almost like putting, put, putting a band aid onto something that's never really going to heal. So, an inherent nature that's actually actively causing a lot of the problems within nature instead of the active symptoms of that, right? And that kind of led me down this whole understanding of what were the behavioral mechanisms of humans that had led to that. And I'm currently still on that journey, but that has found what I'm currently in psychological research, which is basically helping me understand a bit more about what the mechanism, mechanisms of a human or humans are and to try and almost try and unlock that question or answer that question in some way. Um, and yeah, so it was very spontaneous, uh, kind of got into this career and it's, it's incredibly um, interesting, just looking at mental health research, predominantly postnatal depression and perinatal mental illness in both mothers and fathers and looking at the stigma associated um, around that. Um, I would say to answer your second question with regards to um the read network um the racial um equality and ethnic diversity ecological network um it was birthed from my own experiences i realized that i think how i got into zoology i <laughs> wasn't too sure i'd always loved animals from just um my grandma being a big inspiration for me she's a, a botanist to an extent, a self-proclaimed botanist with loads of plants and inspired me, you know, going in, in a, what I like to call a concrete jungle because she grew up in, well, she she lives in Peckham, so there's not that much path life in Peckham, but there's, she made her own little um, wildlife hub, I would say, and that inspired me to go down that path. Um, and I would 
when it came to choosing my A-levels, I typed in, okay, what's zoology? And what, what, what can you do with animals, zoology? And I typed in zoology. And as a black person or person of colour, you often type in, okay, what well, black zoology? Let me see who's, who's doing things, who's um, notable within the field. And nothing came up in Google. This was back in like 2012. I mean, nothing came up and like zilch, no, no responses. Maybe, maybe one or two from America, but when I typed in black British, it didn't exist. I thought that was interesting. And I think part of my nature, I'm quite um, confident in myself. I was like, okay, fine, I'll just be the first. So I, I went on, I, I just did that and, you know, went to do zoology and I didn't really see anyone like me. Um, but that in itself, I still faced a lot of the problems that leaving that, realizing I wasn't the only one. There were a lot of me, a lot of people that looked like me, but they had the same kind of mentality and they did feel extremely isolated. And that in itself is a big barrier into continuing within the sector. And I realized, um, one, um, it's very hard to get into something when you can't envision yourself doing that. And by, and I think a lot of people's inspirations are by having models or role models within that sector or field. And I thought just even when I was studying zoology, that was just an inherent problem. And that, oh, there's nothing really, no one really li looking like me. Like, who, who am I going to lean on? Who am I go going to see, in as, see as a mentor? Like, um, and I do understand for some people that you do need people to look like you, to kind of, you want to emulate them in some way. And uh, after finishing, I had this, I, it, was, it was always, it was always like a back of my, in the, in the back of my head, in my subconscious, oh, that needs to be fixed, but how is that going to be fixed? And I, I came up with an idea of having like a black zoologist network and stuff like that. I was in the um, African and Caribbean society. So I saw it was possible to have this interconnected, deep interconnected network between different universities for people that looked quite similar to you, had similar experiences. So I thought I could emulate that within zoology. Um, didn't come into fruition just because I got distracted. But during the Black Lives Matter movement last year, I had a I had a, a curious email that was sent to me by uh, my master's supervisor at, um, at Nottingham, at the university I was at. And I was, he basically proclaimed to me that he was the only black student or person he had ever taught in his what was 20 years tenure, or um, his 20 years uh, within the university in ev or evolutionary biology, ecology. And he, and he couldn't think of one black British evolution ecologists and that I that was a person who was very notable in the university a person who had a lot of influence and he basically asked me what what could he do to fix that and that's I think a lot of people of color can resonate from that question in that you almost put on a pedestal a, a voice for your for your race I would say rather than as an individual so I was very careful what I was going to say next because the words had a lot of weight behind that and I think in that moment, I was for, you know, what I told, what I pitched my idea of the network. I thought the best way to actively fix a problem like that is by um, creating or active, having almost a conveyor belt for representation, a hub of people that you can look to. Like, okay, cool. Like, this is a person that I can see myself in. I can do this and actively destroy the stereotype of what ecologist is. You know, I say ecologist, and I, even to this day, I say, oh, I, I studied zoology. The first reaction is of surprise. That shouldn't be the case. You know, that should be something that should be acceptable. It's a surprise because, as I say, ecologist or biologist, you think of David Attenborough, you think of um, a white biologist or ecologist, you know, in the fields or savannas in East Africa or in the marine, you know, off the coast of Australia looking at coral reefs. And that isn't actually the case and actually isn't representative of the world, of the global South. And um, yeah, so it kind of just led me to creating a hub of support, academic support, the Read Ecological Network. Um, it's growing very rapidly, very fast. And people who look like me and it's um, within the sector, I like to call them icebergs that are drifting in a vast swathful ocean of information, but do exist. And the network is almost like uh, serves as a form of, as a tree, or, or it has a root-like system that connects all these different dots and just groups them up into a, a large space um, to one, help have that integral networking that is in, it's needed and is something that is um, uh, a prerequisite within actually continuing down the academic route 
Um, you need that. You need networking skills and understanding people within this sector to help you. And I think with a person of colour, when you leave your a fish out of the ocean, you have no idea what to do. And that in itself, I've realised, is a big limiting factor in actually continuing down the route of environmental sciences and ecology. And uh, the network serves to kind of just ease that pressure. And also to people existing within the field, you know, existing in those sectors. And it doesn't have to be academic. It can be just even environmental enthusiasts. Um, we have members from all over, old, young, um, uh, from elsewhere too. Um, Brazilian, we have a person on the committee, Arodo, he's a Brazilian. Uh, works with trees, cannot remember their name, sorry. It's a very um, niche aspect of ecology. Um, but incredibly interesting research, and he's been very passionate and he's relayed his own experiences and actively helps us, uh, you know, um, define what the Reed Ecological Network is. And yeah, um, that's what the Reed Ecological Network is. It's growing. We're here for support um, and to connect individuals to big organisations like what Wildlife Trust and etc. But like, yeah, that's fantastic. Wow, like thank you, thank you for the work that you're doing. And yeah, I could just imagine that just even for kids growing up, um, yeah, people of color, kids, kids growing up who who don't have those role models, like even just having more more visibility, more role models to yeah, to look up to, that would also create that cycle and encourage more people um of color to go into zoology and ecology. That's awesome. Um, we've only got seven minutes left before we close and there's one question from the audience so I guess we're going to make it a little bit short but it connects to young people and education um, and the question is in response to the ecological emergency and the focus next week on COP26 what recommendations would you make to ensure that young people can be engaged in imaginative solutions to climate change and how can we embed these processes in a reimagined education system? Which is obviously quite an enormous question for, yeah, for five minutes. Ruben, do you want to jump in? Maybe a minute or two? Yeah, minutes? just a quick, yeah, just a quick. I would, I would say, um, personally, I'm a bit annoyed with that question because I feel like a lot of the blame is shifted onto young people. I feel like if we spoke to a, especially a, an older person who actually has the influence and the power to actually change things now, they almost kick the can down the road and we can't keep doing that uh, i think we're at, we, we, we were we, we we should have stopped doing that 20 years ago essentially and i feel like that question should really be posed to a person in power so an adult what can you do to actively change things you know actively help influence or change things for the betterment of the future and um but yeah so i just wanted to make that comment quickly but yeah I would like to add on to what uh, Ruben was saying with like, yes, definitely we need to say, again, put the question back to the people in power, but then the people in power, once they acknowledge their importance and their power, they definitely need to come back to talking and talking to the young people, talking to indigenous people, talking to the people who actually are thinking about how to make this, how to make this transformative change and transforming our education system happen because we have gone through what they have created as an education system and we know what's not working. We also know that where we need to lead, what, uh, what future we are envisioning and how we need to get there. And I think that is where also that uh, young people definitely need to have a seat at the table. They definitely need to, uh, in, the, in the coming COP, also push for intergenerational equity, uh, push for a meaningful and effective participation of young people, which goes definitely beyond tokenism, but actually giving them an effective seat at the table where they can tell you what they believe in and giving um, being there to listen, but also incorporate some of that and, you know, not tokenize them. I think these are some of the key things that you really need to see if you want to move towards that. And once you do give them the seat at the table and you listen to them, you will already see that they have ways in which they're thinking about uh, pathways of creating this transformation to happen. And yeah, and then get, get more and more space for all kinds of, uh, you know, stakeholders to come in and all kinds of actors to come in to really um, enhance this process and, you know, build, uh, build, uh, build it into uh, the transformation that we are trying to push for. So I would say that could be some, some of the key things that we should see when we are going towards COP as well. Brilliant, thank you. And, and what I'm kind of hearing in both of your answers is also yes, imagination and yes, 
young people and yes, listening to people, but actually listening and implementing because actually we, you know, there, there's been a lot of expression from uh, young people, from indigenous people, from all sorts of different people. But if the listening is not there, then we can make as much space as we want. Um, I'm going to pass to Alex who put his hand up and then to Helena, who I think you just also, yeah, maybe just a minute, Alex, and then a minute to Helena. Sure. Yeah, I would just like to add to that, uh, that I think experience, you know, experiencing in a visual way is also absolutely critical. Yesterday I was in my, my daughter's school and I spent an hour just sending seeds around and just letting the kids touch things and discuss things. And I think taking them to, you know, how nature and um, nice places should look like and having that experience, I think, is much more worth than a thousand words or statistics. And I think, um, you know, it's probably a, a much easier task for us to do with environmental crisis than it will be to convince them about the importance of quantum physics, for instance, or something that is very abstract. Actually, the, you know, ex an experience in nature is something that sticks to the memory. And I think we can use it much more. And I think our school systems need to have that uh, much more focus on that and bring in the, the, the young people um, to those places so they can really understand what we're talking about. Because biodiversity is still very, very abstract for a lot of people um, and I think we need to, to have that connection and, and that's through experiences and that's what we're trying to do here as well so having a lot of activities where people can touch and smell and feel and, and taste um, that, that's really something that marks them and I think we can take advantage of that I'll stop there thank you Helena one minute for you as well I'd love to hear your thoughts yeah um, well first about education I think uh why education keeps failing us is well one because it's uh it's not accessible and it's um uh, you know not equal for all that's one of the main issues but when it comes to even education that is of quality um it's only based on quality in the western world which means that it will not um be successful in other cultures which is the main problem in in um, in you know the global south with a very different culture than uh, the western and the north, uh, the global north. Um, so when it comes to like every type of education, it should always be based on the reality of pe on, of, of the people it's supposed to serve. Um, and and same so goes for just like holding a conversation. As I said, you always need to um, base it on you know the the understanding that people have of the world um, about youth at COP. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with Ruben. I, I'm 19. I've been in uh, this type of work since I was 13. Uh, and I honestly would prefer not to have to attend COP this year. Um, I have a lot else to do in the Amazon, but here I am. Um, but uh, I, I think the main issue with COP is that the people that are attending and that, ha that are in power, um, the people attending the leader summit, they're actually not, not there because they're uh, interested. They, they are there because they're almost obligated. There is this certain pressure for them to attend. And there is, you know, they are the ones uh, refusing to take the steps that are necessary. Um, so young people have been there. People, indigenous people have been there, not even... Not enough, but there has been presence. There has always been some presence, even if it hasn't been enough, even if it's been very limited. There has always been presence. There have always been voices, um, you know, but that is not taken into consider consideration, not because it's not valid, not because it's not there, but because people actually don't want to listen. Um, and that is like one of the main issues here. How do we get people to listen? And I think, you know, if people don't want to, like the president of my country is probably going to have a very beautiful speech about how amazing nature is in Ecuador, which it is because my people have taken care of it. Um, but at the same time, he will go back. And then in the next um, couple of months, he's planning to expand the, the, the oil exploration in Ecuador, which is, you know, so contradictory to what he will say probably in the next few days here in Glasgow. Um, so, yes, in the uh, indigenous and, and young people's voices are super important, but they need to be at the center so that there is no excuse to not listen to them, you know. Um, and then again, the people that actually have the power to, to make decisions, they're not interested in making those, those decisions. So we really need to start this conversation about, okay, 
who is COP for, who is supposed to be at COP. And COP is a huge space. There is so many zones. There's so many like different type of works going on. And not every single one of those have actually, for example, policy power. Um, just to like put it out, like how things um, work. Um, so yeah, that's my take on that. Thank you. I'm glad we had that question as a provocation as it also takes us to thinking about COP next week and the limitations, you know, we can, as we've spoken about in this panel, there can be, uh, you know, we've spoken about inviting new voices in, we've spoken about using new textures of communication, of art, of working with feeling, we've spoken about embedding those into policy and, and in inviting new voices into science, into yeah, into the discourse, but at the core, if there isn't a capacity and an openness to listen, then nothing will change long term. I think that's a really good place to wrap and close. And I just want to thank you all, all of our amazing panelists. Thank you, Marcus, Sweta, Helena, Ruben, and Alex. It's been a super interesting and rich discussion. And yeah, I wish you all well in the work that you're doing in the coming week and the weeks after that. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.